So welcome to the Bold Moves webinar, Escaping the Owner's Trap. And we, we got, you know, John and I, you know, looking forward to walking through, you know, what is the owner's trap? How do people get stuck kind of stuff? So uh, my, my name is Kirk. I'm the CEO of Foresight CFO. I have my growth CFO partner, John, with me. And put your, uh, you know, if you're just coming in, put your, um, the this, this city that you're in into the chat box so that we know who's interacting with us. Um, but we, we love to talk with, interact with CEO business owners who want to do even better. So our prior webinar was about people, the X factor. You know, this webinar is about CEOs escaping the owner's trap. You might be wondering why growth CFOs like us are doing webinars about people. Shouldn't we be doing just the numbers and the plumbing and all that kind of stuff to make sure that the back office is working well? So why are growth CFO experts at escaping the owner's trap? You, you know, we're going to find out within the next 30, 40 minutes, we're going to, we're going to lay out the case on, on why we're, we're guiding CEOs to escape the owner's trap. And there's going to be three key takeaways. You know, the first one is what is the owner's trap? The second one is what is the cost of being stuck? And the third one is our escape plan. That's where it gets fun right so the john why, why don't you give us some background about the superstar all right so one of the things we notice working with our clients that there's only one ceo and there's a million problems and in the owner's trap we find sometimes companies are uh, are, are stuck and they get stuck where the owner feels he has to fix everything all that the owners there's an example of one company that we thought we'd talk about which kind of Kind of made checked every box. Uh, this man was a, a, a brilliant sales guy, and he built up a company, a forty-seven million dollar company, uh, through his sales efforts. And along the way, he hired friends and uh, and people he liked to help him. And but he was always part of every meeting and on on starting to grow. But when he got up to the higher numbers, he found that he was more and more pulled into uh, these kind of uh, everyday problems. There's just not enough of them to go around. And, and that's the beginning of the owner's trap. When you think you're the only person uh, that can solve uh, the problem. And what happens is you get pulled into every meeting and the meetings get more and more important. And then, then you're, the people you hired, uh, because you're in every meeting, they don't make decisions. They let you make the decision. So if they're in a meeting alone, they don't make a decision, they wait for you. And, and you get, actually all of your time gets swallowed up on small decisions. And that's where this man found himself. Oh, next slide, Kirk. I mean, John, just a little bit here. I, I, I literally remember him. I mean, he 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 was a royal flush. He's an expert in sales. Anybody who do forty million dollars of sales is, is you know top notch. He he had all delivery people reporting directly to him, and he was still doing part of it on his own shoulders. Uh, support functions were coming to him. Banks auditors, lenders, right? We're all coming to the, the, the CEO, right? And, yep. and the management team, you know, for the size of the company that was, I mean, 40, you know, only 9% of companies make it past a million. So 47 million, that's a substantial co company. And his management team were really lightweights. I mean, they, they yeah. were they were junior, I mean, green, right? And, you know, when he they, pulled us in, we couldn't get uh, we couldn't get a report out of them. I'll yeah. go through it. Yeah, they, they, exactly they, right. Yeah, they, they, they weren't organized. I mean, the daily priorities were set by by the fires. Uh, financials were not accurate. Literally, you know, fin the financial statements were, were so inaccurate, they, they didn't look at them, right? They're literally blind and blind. Why well, look at the financials when you can just, you know, run hard? Yeah, make, um, make, sell another contract. Yeah. Make up. Yeah, and they you know, didn't have that forward-looking visibility and um, didn't have fall-through, right? Even, even mm -hmm. the, the clarity they had to, you know, run a better business they um, wouldn't follow through on those actions to create you know, either a stronger capacity to do something or business development, right? Yep. So, All right. Well, the second phase of this story, Kirk, is uh, so when this is where the CFO has become concerned. Okay, so you see your owner doing this kind of behavior, and then you realize that down the road is going to come a uh, serious uh, uh, business problems that are going to have money attached to them. So one of the, the first sign of that is when you start spending uh, today's money on on on, uh, on yesterday's bills, and you your working capital shrinks, selling as hard as you can, but you're not keeping up. You lose track of your money. 
And then, so you run harder, you sell harder, you sell more to make up the gap. Uh, that, and you can work Superman. And most business owners are Superman. They're they, you know, type A people. They're, they're not shy and insecure. When they want to work hard, they work hard. So that works until there's a big event, which kind of prevents, which kind of caves in your market. In this case, sales decline because the, the, they couldn't get good financials to support that contract. And they, his sales started declining. And without new sales to pay old bills, uh, it started, the debt started piling up and collecting. And he started to, and the whole um, house of cards began to unravel as they do. So the bank calls, they want their loan. Uh, the tax people call, you didn't pay enough in taxes and we need your taxes for next year. And pretty soon uh, you, you're borrowing Peter to pay Paul, as they say, and you, um, your working capital shrinks, and then you you have to borrow very expensive short-term money. And it's a merry-go-round effect. The faster the merry-go-round goes, the dizzier you get. And there you go. And at some point, you start laying off people, and pretty soon you lay off not just the fat, but you start cutting the muscle. And that means the owner then has to go back and fix the things that this very capable person used to do. And then and it feeds on itself. And soon you're not able to actually put the proposals out fast enough to get the good contracts. Or if you have a delivery failure, you get a reputation for not delivering on your contracts and then you don't win new ones. So this chain reaction, um, um, squirrel cage really, faster, faster, faster until something breaks. And that's what happened with this company. Yeah, you, you literally feel the house of card effects where you get pieces are holding this part up, that part, this, the, you know, just things are starting to unravel. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a dreadful feeling, right? When the pieces start coming, coming apart. And it's, it's not unusual. Many, many of our customers are in some piece. Often come to us when they're in some piece of this pickle. Yeah, that's that's the starting point, not the finishing point. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's and that's that's when so. When that happens, so when when the, when the when the business caves in this case, he went he shrunk to five million dollars from forty seven. So this was like a a horrific earth shaking crash, uh, but he still has the debt. He's responsible for the debt of a forty seven million dollar company, and there's no way that five million dollar company can pay that off. Yeah. In that case, um, you become a, a, a death spiral. You're circling the drain, and it's hard to get out of that whirlpool. Um, this is why when, when CFOs, when I, as a CFO, when I see a customer that's even pre pretending or put their toe in this kind of predicament, I, I actually bring that up because I can see the money problems coming from the decision problems that are ahead of them. And that's where we like to, that's where we earn our name, foresight, where you can see problems coming, you head them off at the pass, and then the, the people problems don't become money problems. The decision problems don't become money problems. And then, uh, then uh, you can you can head this off. But if you don't, it's very spectacular when that house of cards comes down. Yeah, yeah, literally, you can fill up. I mean, at one point you're doing forty-seven million top line revenue, and then just unravel down to a five million dollar company, and you're you're left with, in this case, eight million dollars of tax liability from the bigger company, and some of that, you know, some things going on with the company actually. Some of that laid on his personal tax liability, which is you know, extreme, and no no cash to pay it. So let, let's get into it. Like what what is the owner's trap, right? The, the owner's trap literally is when the, the owner is in the center and they're a hub for everything, right? There there's one spoke going out where you know doing doing sales, another spoke going out still involved in delivery, maybe actually doing delivery. Uh, employees are reporting direct to the CEO. Customers come to the CEO when there's a problem. And you, you can feel it. You, you feel the weight of the world on the shoulders of the, the CEO. And the symptoms are you know, revenue's flat. It could be multiple years. I, I don't know why we're stuck. Or, you know, year after year, we're, we're about the same place we were last year. And, uh, you know, another symptom is you, you're doing the work and you look down to the bottom line and like, where's the money? I mean, doing 1.4% profitability when, you know, what's, what's your industry doing? Um, so what, doing all this work and not having a profit, may, maybe you're making the household income you, you need to, maybe not. Uh, that, that's another symptom, right? Household income isn't quite to the place where, where it needs to be so that you can breathe, right? Employee turnover, right, is, is, is another symptom. They're, they're, you know, especially if your A players are leaving, they're frustrated. They're not 
They, they haven't found a place to really do their best work with you, so you're not getting that discretionary work. Um, symptoms, 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 right? It kind of feels like when you fix one part of the business, another part is caving yeah. in, like that house of cards, <laughs> right? Yeah. And then, you know, I mean, it's like almost dominoes. You're chasing one thing after another and, uh, you know, not quite getting out in front of it. Um, if, you, if you feel compelled, you're going into Friday, and you feel compelled to work on some part of the weekend, you're going to work all day Sunday, right? Owner's trap. Owner's trap. These are all the symptoms. If you go on vacation, and if vacation is more like you're working remotely because you, you got your phone with you, right? And you're taking the call. You might be on the beach, but you're working, right? And, it, and it, 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 you know, in my case, I'm married. When I do that, when, I, when we started, I did that. Um, my wife would look at me <laughs> cross-eyed the whole time, right? <laughs> you know, like, why on vacation if you're, if you're just working? And it feels disorganized, right? And even if you, you, you can't make 25 minutes to hop on a discovery call with me, those are, that's, you know, those are all symptoms of being in the owner trap. So, John, what, what is the cost of being in the owner trap? So th this is where where we actually can quantify some of the uh, some of the damage being done by your company by your, your inability to get out of the owner's trap. So um, first thing is dropping prospects. You can't get back to people that are important to you. Um, second thing is customer complaints go up because you put yourself at the front line all the time. Unless the customer is talking to you, they're not satisfied. And so this becomes. Um, customer satisfaction drops and not because you're any less good than you were, but because you just don't have time to give the attention to each customer that they need. Third, and the, the other, the next weakness that starts costing you money is when you can't pay attention to your employees. If they're doing something wrong or if they're doing something poorly, you, de you haven't seen them work or haven't been in touch with them enough to head it off the pass and they might do something poorly for six months to do a lot of money. And so it's those hidden costs that the lack of supervision and lack of oversight, uh, because there's only one of you, there's 24 hours in the day, and there's infinite problems. So managing, placing up those problems is what we're going to talk about in the next couple of slides. The real cost that is very much understated is the opportunity cost. Because you're so focused on putting out fires and rushing from meeting to boring meeting to boring meeting, you're not doing what got you where you are. The brilliance that you show, either in sales, marketing, relationships with vendors, whatever your secret sauce is for the success of your company, you're not doing that because you're stamping out fires all around your company. And to me, that's actually, as a CFO, that's where the future growth is gone. You might survive. You might just decline a little. You're not going to grow because you, the rainmaker, is tied down with the everyday stuff. You know, the, literally, the CEO is the bottleneck, like you know, the hospital, the waiting room, all these different, it could, be, it could be customers, employees, vendors, everyone's in a waiting room trying to get to the, to the CEO because, again, yeah. uh, the owner's trap, it's all, it's all on my shoulders. You, you have to come to me or, or no decision is made, right, that, that kind of stuff. So, so let's, I mean, you know, being the bottleneck, and he, he, here's another big cost of, of being stuck in the owner's trap. Uh, John? Yeah, this is the uh, the time. Actually dividing yourself in enough little pieces to actually give people, again, you're in a people business, kind of attention and the detail that they need to make things work properly. Uh, a lot of times you can keep things afloat desperately if you're going from meeting to meeting, but you can't actually make them work well, and you can't make them work in an excellent fashion. You can't get the growth curve you and that's where the, the time really starts to bite. And the second thing Kirk already mentioned, you miss your kid's uh, piano recital or baseball game, or you're late all the time, or you take calls in the middle of your kid's uh, uh, play at school. This is, uh, number one, it's, it's tough on the marriage. And number two, it's tough on your kids. And number three, it's tough on you. So I, I made a, last time I went on vacation, I finally gave my phone to my wife and every that calls, she answered. And quite a few of those calls didn't have to be taken, it, it, it seems. So I think uh, <laughs> that that's a, there's a, there's ways to get out of that owner's trap. But until you do, the clock owns you. You don't, you don't manage the clock, it manages you. And that becomes a real problem. Yeah, so, so, so there's that time freedom. You become, you know, 
24 hours a day, seven days a week. You can't go on vacation. If you go on vacation, there's concern that when you come back, the business is going to be less yeah. less well, kind of kind of stuff. Yeah. So so time freedom is a big thing that we lose if we're in the owner's trap. And this and it directly relates to this one, which is the money picture. Realistically, um, you can survive for a couple of weeks or months of running around like a chicken with your head cut off. But the uh, the long term cost, the five year cost of running your business like that is immense because you do not get the multiplier effect of profitability. So, so one of the things are you end up with less income today because things are not running at one hundred percent. Uh, if you sell your company, whoever buys you is going to look at your company and say, you know, I won't buy this company unless you stay here for at least two and a half years to five years. And then I'll give you a little bit of money every year because you're the one that makes this company go. You, When you set up your company to sell, uh, again, we say you get paid twice, once your salary and another time when you exit the company, having built a really uh, profitable business. But if you can't get out of it, you actually are enslaved by it. Um, secondly, you don't get as much money as you might have otherwise. The risk factors dampen down the offering price. You might have a really brilliant company because you're the only one that can make it work. People are scared to give you what it's really worth. And instead of having a you know a, a 10 or $15 million exit, you might end up with a six or a four. Yeah. So that's that's significant amount of money by not getting your hands around this problem. And then uh and, and the the final uh, thought here is that that the when you're managing this company over the time period, the owner's trap affects every level of your growth and uh, and success. Yeah, I mean, so so really, I mean, you know, John John Worrell in his book Built to Sell, he gets into it where he he he's basically a, a research company for small privately held businesses. And he shows that if, if there's, there's eight drivers that are good for performance and owner trap is you know, the largest significant one of them, in, in general, if, they, if the drivers aren't working for you, if you're trapped in some way, you got dependencies throughout your business, on average, your business is, is, is 7 you percent know, less valuable compared to your, your competitors. Said the other way, if you, if you got the, the drivers working for you, you're 71% more valuable than your average competitor, right? And you can transfer the business after a short, maybe it's three to six months transition when you step back, sell your business so you get paid twice. You need three to six months transition, something like that versus two and a half years. You know, imagine, you know, you're a business owner and now for two and a half years, you're the employee of your former business <laughs> and a significant part of your payout is tied up to how well you perform that two and a half years where you, you you had the responsibility of outcomes, but you don't have the same authority. And the first for the first time in many years, you know, the CEO is an employee again. It it doesn't go well. It's a it's a miserable experience for most of us, right? To, to be back in that that situation. And most of the time we don't we don't get all the payout that we expected. So this is why growth CFOs, this is why we're experts at escaping the owner's trap because it's, it's a key constraint to doing well now, household income, and it's a key constraint into building that value in, in, in your business. And in fact, you know, this people capacity is one of the, the five obstacles to growth to, to get that time and financial freedom that you're looking for. So, so let, let, let's go right into our, our escape plan, right? And this is where it gets fun. You know, in, we're, we're gonna show you proven methods that to to you know get the freedom where you can you can work to your best purpose and do even better and you may initially think that you're already doing some of the things that we talk about some things might be new altogether some things you might have heard about or thought about before you might think that you're you're doing these things already but I'm going to ask you to, to pause and consider are you really really doing it are you, are you getting the outcomes from doing those methods that you need? On, are, you getting them on a, are you doing this on a spiritual level to get that bigger outcome? Because a lot of people do things on a certain level, but they're not, they're not gonna get that, you know, that, that bang for the buck. So the, the first proven method is establish your destination. You know, and by this, you know, there's, there's a couple things to do. You know, first, create a matrix, list out all your responsibilities. 
And in the first column, mark the ones that you love doing, that, that literally like you were born to sell. You were born to create your solution and train people to deliver according to your way. Mark, mark those things with a check. Those, those are things that you want to keep doing because that's kind of, that's why you're here. Um, then in the next column over, write down, if it's not the thing that you were born to do, write down who should be doing it. Maybe it's somebody that's already on your team that they can literally take responsibility for that deliverable. Maybe it's somebody to be determined, right? You haven't built capacity yet to have them hired, to have them there. So write that down because you're going to take that out, that output. So you got, now you got the matrix, your best use matrix, mm -hmm. and use that to create your future org chart at whatever, what revenue level do you need to be at to have the type of capacity where you're truly focused on your best purpose? Right. And then, you know, literally lay out the future org chart at that revenue level. If it's having that sales and marketing function, delivery, the back office support, whatever it is that you need, your talent group. Right. Um, and it's okay, you know, for the people you don't have to be determined. Right. But, but now, now you have visibility. You can see where you got to end up. Right. So the, the whole clarity on destination. The, the next step is build your financial flight plan. You know, now that you got this, the, the view of the business at that higher revenue level, you know, create that financial flight plan, you know, the straight line from here to there. And it, this is, when I say financial flight plan, it's your integrated business model, right? If you, if you change certain variables in your business, how does that impact profitability as well as your network on your balance sheet and cash, right? So integrated business model, not just the, the income statement. And, um, you know, that, so, so yeah, that, that straight line, the full capacity, what does it take to build your, your sales organization, your delivery, your back office support, your, your navigator, the people on your management team who are making things happen. Um, and then you can, you, can, you can literally, on a timeline, figure out at which point across the months are you gonna transfer that role to the right person? Some things might be out future years, but, but right now, the next 12 months, what are you actually gonna transfer? Start taking that weight off your shoulders, right? Um, Right, and you may be able to do this. To, you may be able to do this at your current size, depending how big you are. If you just get clear on what what your best purpose is, what that org chart, chart is, the best use, you, you may be already at the revenue size to, to do it, and then implement it across you know the next twelve months. Right, where you're, you're training people, making sure that they pick up the torch really well. Uh, and then one of the keys on, as you draft out your, your financial flight plan is do the what if. There's always a better path. The baseline version one is rarely the best way to do it. What if, what if, what if we A, B, C, right? Especially now as you're going into 2023, do, you know, spend that extra critical thinking on the what if piece. The, the next step is build, you got the org chart, you got the financial fl flight plan, right? So the, you can see where you're going. You got clarity and confidence on that piece. Now you got to start to do it, right? Build people capacity, recruiting, onboarding, continuous mastery. Right, uh, people are no, you know, the, the, no matter what type of business you're in, people tend to play a significant role. Right, some businesses are more people intensive, others are less, but still the people at whatever level are, are very significant. So, some some key tools in recruiting are, you know, do you have a compelling mission and mission, vision, values? Would you want to work at your business? Because if you're just showing up for work and a paycheck, that, that's you know the great resignation. A lot of people walked away from those companies. So I'm recruiting, you know, do you have a compelling reason beyond the paycheck for people to come and be part of your team? Are you measuring fit, like using culture index or um, uh, predictive index, right? Their natural fit to the job. Are you assessing skills, right? For whatever job they are, do, are you measuring it? Or, or just going by based on the conversation? Was it a good discussion or not, right? What does your, your gut tell you? Uh, and then, you know, the, the a, a talk rating interview, method like brad smart described those are good to, uh, that's a good thorough review um for, you know less shooting from the hip more you know investing time on on, on what matters so recruiting there, there's things like that you can do to get uh, a better outcome onboarding you know do have you established the company way do you have a written playbook are you able to onboard people in, in a way to you know you know really three to six months find out if they if they have what it takes uh, continues mastery Right? Do, do your team members have a written plan on how they're getting even better at what they do? Are they meeting with their manager every week right, to make sure that there's that investment in people skill? So 
Um, building people capacity is huge. The, the more intentional you are having the right environment, um, the more likely you're, you're to, to thrive through any economic situation. And the last, the last key thing to do is ensure follow through. And, you know, so going back to that weekly performance management huddle. Uh, next item, daily dashboard. Can that employee come to work every day and see exactly where they stand, red, green, yellow, what, what's off, so that they can proactively take action and get, get you back on flight plan for their, you know, the, the things that they directly control, right? Every day, they, they, especially if you have a distributed workforce, now that more people are working virtually, even if you're in the same office, do they know, right? Every day, that daily, daily dashboard. Are team members working inside the system? Right. If, if they're doing sales, are they in a CRM? If they're doing projects, client delivery, whatever you might might be doing, is, is there a, a project management system? Is there a trouble ticket? You know, depending on what you're doing, are they working inside a system, or do they have a old fashioned pen and paper working inside their head and doing doing kind of whatever? You don't you don't really know what they're doing. Post it uh, note. What, what's that? Yeah, post it. Post it note. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let, let, that's random. And then. Um, have you trained the people to use the financials, the monthly financials, the managers? Have you trained them to use the financials like a scoreboard so they can see, you know, what's the number story, over or under, and why? And they can take action proactively without it being on the CEO's shoulder. Have, have you trained managers, if they're using the, the monthly financials every month as a habit, are they, um, have you trained them to, in, you know, do their budget, which is the next 12 months, month by month, based on the outcomes you, you, you want to get, your objectives, how to engineer profitability, right? Uh, you know, budget is a bad name to people, but man, it's, it's a beautiful thing when it, when it starts, you know, mo most business people aren't spreadsheet people, so they avoid it, right? But once they start getting into it, that, that second or third time, they, they're they learning how to make, you know, take their operational plans, their ideas about sales or whatever their responsibility is, put it to numbers, see if it adds up across time, then use that as a measuring stick every month to um, follow through and, um, you know, letting go of the idea of, of, you know, a lot of times you hear with managers who aren't strong in budgeting is that, hey, I don't know what's gonna happen six months from now, so I, I, I can't budget. But the answer is, yeah, you can, based on what you know now, what's reasonable. And uh, the, the budget only needs to be approximately correct. It doesn't need to be exactly right. So let go, this whole idea of perfection, let it go. You're either gonna be above or below the main thing is you have a number to measure against and so that you can you can take action. So th those four things, you're doing those four things and not, not one time, but consistently, each time taking it to the next step, uh, destination clarity, financial flight plan, building people capacity and, and having the tools and method in your company way to ensure follow through. Um, if you're doing that and you can, you can trust people to use your methods and you have a way of the online of sites of seeing who, who is and who isn't, then uh, the owner starts to be able to step back. You can go on vacation and leave your cell phone at, at, you know, at home or in the car or whatever, right? Um, and you're not worried about coming back and you know the warehouse is on fire kind of stuff. Okay, and so we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna land, bring things in here. The, um, it, it's normal to get trapped. I mean, you remember Michael Gerber's the ebook, where um, wearing all the hats is normal, especially if you started your business as either maybe you're the only founder, maybe there's a couple of founders. It's still a small group wearing lots of hats, um, and then uh, it's also normal to get stuck. I mean, business to get stuck somewhere between you know between the one to five million dollar level. It's almost like a black hole. The inertia is so strong it keeps pulling your your opportunities to leap ahead back into the, you know, the, the status quo revenue size at one to 5 million seems to be a, a, a pretty strong stall point. And it's simply because you don't have the managerial capability. You haven't hit that flywheel level where things are working beyond your, your fingertips. And then there's a second stall point um, at, at somewhere around 20 million. And, and it's obviously different for different businesses, different industry, but somewhere around there, man, what was, we got past the 5 million, we hit the flywheel, we got to 20 million. And it, uh, it's stalled. You might start sliding backwards because there, there's a there's kind of a yo-yo effect going on. Um, oftentimes, it's, it's it's the management, right? The 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 methods, the systems, the the objectives, the culture isn't on par. 
to go beyond that, that $20 million level. So, so it's a hard stop and it's frustrating. So to bring it home here, growth CFOs are, are navigators for CEOs, right? The, the, the growth CFO work is to get CEOs unstuck and address, a lot of times if, if my business is stuck as a CEO, it, it's me, right? There's something I'm doing that's not giving us lift. Um, so, so growth CFO help you make it to your destination, just like a, a navigator is to a CEO pilot. We, we literally wrote the book, right? Our, uh, the growth CFO void. Um, if you haven't read it, grab a copy. It's on Amazon, Audible, Kindle. Uh, it'll definitely open up some, some bigger possibilities. If you email me, I'll send you a copy. Um, our, our purpose as growth CFOs is to ensure higher revenue, right? We, we get into areas that most CEOs, uh, traditional CEOs won't get into, like, you know, that, that whole operation that winning, winning new clients, more profit, better cash, and then um, increasing the value of your business. So you have that second payday, right? You're making good household in income today, but then tomorrow you get that second, the big check and financial freedom and time freedom at that point. Uh, and the benefit is huge, right? Uh, those drivers of which uh, owner trap is, is a huge one. When they're in your, working in your favor, uh, on average, businesses are 71% more valuable than their competitors. That's the pot of gold where you both got freedom of time and freedom of money. So uh, if, if you're interested, you know, for, for us, for, you know, the, the, the first step, if you want to see what a growth self can do to really help you accelerate your business and schedule a 25 minute discovery call with me, the link is on the website, right? Uh, foresightcfo.com. And then 25 minutes, we'll, you'll be amazed how far we get in, in 25 minutes to see what, what you could do with, with your business and we're getting stuck. So with that, that's, that's a wrap. And John, do you got anything you want to say to wrap up? Well, I think we've, we've hit it pretty hard, but I think the key point is if you find yourself doing all those things, you've got to back out slowly. Back, put, put down the, the, the task and back away slowly until you can hand off more and more of your work to people you trust. The owner trap is normal. Real and, thing. And it's possible to get at whatever tipping point you're at, let, let's get past it so your life is even better. But hey, thank you for join, joining us. And I look forward to having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with each of you. So see you soon. Bye-bye. Take care.